So, John, on behalf of the ECB and its executive board, it's a great pleasure to have you with us here today, and the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you very much. Let me just see if I can load up the slides. Thank you very much, Luke and everybody, for uh, for, for inviting me. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to, uh, I say, be back at the ECB, but I'm not really back at the ECB. I am uh, virtually back at the ECB during these uh, pandemic times. Um, but, uh, you know, great thing about the pandemic, <laughs> Zoom, is that lots of people can join and can be in a typical ECB room. So I hope you got something out of this. So uh, I'm going to uh, make an argument uh, in this in the uh, in the presentation. Uh, so, you know, I think we you know we all agree, as Luke said, that we face uh, an unprecedented growth challenge coming out of the pandemic, uh, as we hope we are. Um, but what the pandemic has revealed is like a lot of existing weaknesses in uh, politics and the economy, not just in Europe, but also in other parts of of the world. Um, now Europe. The Eurozone had many problems going into the crisis. Uh, and as I'll show you, one of the you know, problems that has been low productivity growth and also a relatively weak labor market. And my view is that we should be thinking about a policy framework which should be unashamedly around regenerating growth. So around you know, growth which is um, both equitable and environmentally sustainable. I can hear a lot of beeping going on in the background with email. Now, I'm going to just check it's not my email, which it's not. If anybody has the, the email on, uh, I can hear a lot of pinging. So uh, if you would mute yourself, that would be great. OK, so how do we get to um, better growth? Well, you know, the key things are about innovation, pushing the frontier, and diffusing those innovations more quickly around the economy. And when I think about those new technologies, obviously there are things like hard technologies, digital technologies, but I'm also going to argue, I think, that some of the, what you might call the softer technologies, things like management and organizational practices, are, are also extremely important in terms of getting to sustainable productivity growth. And I think there's like policy interventions we can do in both of these, these areas. So I'm going to argue that we actually know a lot about what to do in terms of the kinds of policies which could be successful. And what we need to do is to kind of join up these innovation policies into a new Marshall Plan, uh, one which has something both for the short run, and in the short run, as we recover from the pandemic, we need to balance protection. Uh, obviously, you know, we need to make sure that uh, we don't lose too much human capital assets and, and, and financial capital assets by having too much destruction, but we also need a lot of reallocation. So we also need to accept the fact there are going to be some firms or some industries which are not going to return, some jobs are not going to return. And we have to think about ways we can effectively facilitate the reallocation of resources into those new industries and those new, new firms and new jobs. So that's the kind of short, medium run thing. In, in the medium, longer run, we need to, the only way we're going to really get back to uh, sustainable growth is through innovation. And so I think we can think about putting these policies together around missions, especially around climate change, but also around health and, and potentially defense in order to join up some of these innovation policies together. So my view is that you know, vaccines have given us an opportunity. What we need now is some urgency for policy to actually make these growth plans happen. So I'll talk about the challenge. I'll talk a bit about so defending growth. I'll talk a bit about understanding growth, and then I'll give you the bones of a kind of growth plan. So, you know, we know about this picture. This is just GDP growth you know, since uh, 2008. You know, we see the financial crisis back in 2008, 2009. But we also see in both the euro area and the EU, the kind of huge hit our economies have taken due to the, the uh, pandemic and the policies like the lockdown policies, which have had to accompany that. Now, there was some bounce back towards the end of last year, but we know we're now in a a third wave, as you can see from um, these are the kind of COVID cases uh, per hundred thousand, and you can see that you know there was there was the the you know the first wave, second wave, third wave. You can see that Europe is now obviously uh, you know taking a, a big increase of of by the number of COVID cases, and you know vaccines are going to help, but you know the rollout's been slow, so this is also going to cause a hit to the economy, which we're going to see in the numbers as they as they come out. So a big challenge, a big challenge, not just in terms of GDP, but a challenge in terms of jobs. So this is looking at 2020 versus 2019. 
uh, across you know, major economies, we've seen big increases of unemployment wherever we look, um, bigger in some countries than others, but clearly increases of unemployment everywhere due to the pandemic. Um, but I think the most important point is to realize that these, the problem of slow growth and in particular slow productivity growth predates the pandemic. So if you look at uh, EU and Euro area uh, productivity growth, you can see that that was actually slow even coming into the um, uh, prior to the pandemic period and has been slowing down for a number of years. So this is, you know, when we think about how we recover, we got to think not just about the immediate problem of dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic, but this longer run problem of having slow productivity growth. So this is not just a European problem. So this, um, let's think about productivity growth at the frontier. So you think of this as the U US TFP growth. Uh, so, you know, the US is the frontier of many, many industries. So since the Second World War, we've had kind of four distinct periods. So in the kind of um, 20 years after the Second World War, the gold, we had this kind of golden age where TFP growth was uh, going healthily along at something like 2 percentage points a year. Then we had the oil shocks and we kind of crashed back down to about half a percentage points a year of TFP growth. You know, and this was the era, you know, the, the 20 year period where uh, Bob Solo was saying you could see computers everywhere apart the productivity numbers. And then in the third period, we actually then started to see an impact on, on, on productivity. This is a productivity miracle period where productivity, TFP growth seemed to jump up to what it had been again. Um, you know, on the back of the internet, all of this was in IT producing and IT using industries. And, you know, at that point, many people thought that, you know, it was kind of job over. But in fact, since 2004, since the mid 2000s, TFP growth has fallen back uh, to what it was in after the oil shocks. In fact, you know, even even worse. And this, by the way, this is not just the, the financial crisis. Um, this very slow TFP growth you see, even if you just look at the post financial crisis years. So, you know, from, from the sense of what's happening at the kind of frontier productivity growth, this is a real problem. There's, there's been this you know, very significant um, slowdown of productivity growth, which has happened over the last 15 years. Um, so, you know, I, I, you might think, if, uh, given, given that I have an audience of economists, you know, I, I, you know, I may not even need this slide, but in fact, when I talk about this to many people, including many policymakers, um, people, you know, there's a lot of pushback against the emphasis on growth. And it is you know, one important fact, and we should never lose track of this, is that overall growth of the size of the economy is not really important for welfare. What, what matters much more is kind of GDP per person or national income per person. And, you know, what drives that is productivity. So the growth of output per input or GDP per hour is really important. Um, because, you know, increasing GDP just by uh, increasing the fraction of people working or increasing hours, those can be valuable. You know, reducing the high unemployment is the problem, as I said, but there's a limit to how much improvement you can get from just improving capacity utilization. Eventually, you want to improve capacity itself. And in, in the long run, this really is a question of how you improve, improve productivity. Indeed, you know, if you look at wage growth, which is the kind of key thing we care about, over the long run, this does generally follow productivity growth. So, you know, not perfectly. And, you know, I, I've written, and many other people have written on the share of the uh, economic apply going to labour and how that's changed. But in the long run, it tends to be that wage growth follows productivity growth. So productivity growth really is key. And why is it key? Because it increases the size of the economic pie, which gives us choices. You know, we can choose as a society to spend that on public goods like health or education or on more consumption or more leisure or on environmental improvements or redistribution. So I think the real problem that we face is having an era of slow productivity growth and therefore low pay growth has been a major cause of populist problems. And you know, we see from my own country and in other countries, the rise of populists, I think is very much linked to having slow real wage growth over time. So like in the United States, for example, if you're a high school graduate, your real wages, your real mean wages, are more or less the same as they were, if not lower than they were 40 years ago. And so it's unsurprising that people are so angry if the uh, outcomes are so poor in terms of their wages. Um, and I, you know, had I got time, I'd go into more details on this. So, you know, the view that capitalists get all the benefits of growth, not workers, you know, is not true. If you look at many, in, in many countries that although the labor share has fallen, it's still the case that countries with faster productivity growth have had generally faster wage growth. 
Um, faster growth doesn't necessarily mean more inequality. You know, many, many very successful uh, parts of the world, Scandinavian countries with low inequality and also have relatively high productivity. Um, is growth inevitably bad for the environment? Yes, growth poses challenges, but properly measured growth, where you take into account the depletion of natural capital as well as physical capital. Um, you know, if we thought about sustainable growth properly, that it actually, uh, you know, is, is compatible with environmental growth. And if we think about how to deal with the problems of climate change that I'll come back to, the, you know, we're not going to solve the problems of climate change just through taxes and regulation. We're going to have to have a revolution in green technologies, both in the generation of them and also the use of them. Um, my colleague uh, at, at, at LSE, Lord Richard Layard, uh, has argued a lot that growth doesn't make us happier. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, it's true. I would say that, you know, the way to look at this is that, uh, you know, um, growth doesn't uh, guarantee that you're going to be happy, but it certainly uh, reduces the degree of misery that you have. And I think if you do look at um, around the world, uh, there is, a, there is a, a relationship, even actually at high, at high income between measures of life satisfaction and levels of happiness. Now that's not always linear, but uh, there is a kind of relationship there. The, 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 the most strong attack I think on, 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 on an emphasis on growth is that the view that there's actually nothing we can do to improve the growth rate. In fact, many of our economic models take, uh, you know, TFP growth as completely exogenous. And, you know, this kind of pessimism, if you like, around our ability to affect the, affect the rate of growth is in some ways that may be the new normal. Uh, you know, Bob, Bob Gordon has argued that, uh, you know, the great innovations of the past, like the uh, the uh, sanitation and, 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 the, and the toilet system are, you know, we're never going to be able to replicate those with uh, the, the new things we have. And, you know, I, you know, my view is that you know, this is like the argument between traditional economics and modern growth theory. And I think the evidence is generally that there are things that can be done to stimulate innovation and productivity growth. Um, and one piece of evidence on that <laughs> would be the UK experience, actually, for about 100 years between um, 1880 and 1980, the UK kind of fell behind in terms of GDP cap per capita and productivity with its peers in America, Germany and France. But for the 30 years leading up to the global financial crisis, it kind of turned its position around and caught up and overtook many of those countries. And I think, you know, what happened in 1979, 1980 was there was a change in the economic model. There was a under Mrs. Thatcher, under Tony Blair, there was a greater emphasis on um, trying to make markets more competitive, to make labour markets more flexible, to um, you know, reduce subsidies in lame duck industries um, under, say, especially the Brown Blair years to invest more in the growth of human capital and higher education. And I think those policies seem to make a difference. And uh, I, so I think that, you know, that that's a more, much more optimistic view of what we can do. Now, since 2008, the UK position has definitely weakened a lot more. But the fact that the UK's experience and experience of many other countries is suggest policy really does matter and really can make a difference. So how should we understand growth in order to figure out ways and uh, ways of improving it? So as I as I mentioned earlier, I mean growth is fundamentally a story of technological change, not an accumulation of more people or, or more capital. So if we again. Uh, I apologize for using many US examples here. So I mean, spent a lot, a lot of time, my time in the US over the last decade. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I, this, you can get similar kind of things from European data. If you look at US output per hour growth since World War II of about two and a half percentage points, then about 1.1% is capital deepening, 0.4% is labor composition, including human capital. And 2% is from the kind of solo residual uh, from my former, as my former colleague, Bob Solo, pointed out. And we see this in many countries and in many industries and in many areas. The really the fundamental thing is actually to do with, with uh, productivity. Um, now, it's long been recognized that developing countries can grow quickly through diffusion or, or catch up. And if, you, if we think about, you know, the European Union, certainly when, you know, the uh, Eastern European countries, ex-Soviet countries joined, we saw a lot of, uh, you know, productivity growth through this kind of catch up. But for advanced economies in, in Western Europe, you know, frontier innovation has to be key. You know, there's, a, the, the, there's limits towards the kind of catch up model. So there has to be a, a strong emphasis on frontier innovation. But nevertheless, there is still a lot of room for improvement without frontier growth. So both from the faster diffusion of technologies, but also, and this harks back to this eradication point I made earlier, 
towards reducing misallocation, improving the degree to which the economy uh, reallocates output from less productive to more productive firms. So, you know, why is this uh, misallocation or allocation important? There are these huge productivity differences across firms. And, you know, these differences are actually growing larger over time. I have a, um, yeah, my, my Jackson Hole address from a couple of years ago documented this. And we've seen this actually all over the world that the kind of productivity differences have really, uh, are really large and have got expanded over time. And this does suggest there is an issue of kind of increased uh, misallocation, uh, maybe a greater difficulty of trying to get uh, more activity towards the more productive firms. What are the two fundamental sources of growth? Well, on the one hand, we have technology, the kind of hard technologies. On the other hand, we have management and organizational practices. So, you know, I, I shouldn't need, uh, it shouldn't uh, need much convincing for a room for a room full mainly of economists, but technology is critical. So if we think about the history of uh, what's happened since the uh, takeoff of growth since the late 18th century, first we had the kind of industrial revolution around steam power at the end of the 18th century. And then at the end of the 19th century, the kind of, uh, you know, amazing, you know, in, in actually 1879, three major inventions around luminosity, around mobility and around communication, um, which actually led to uh, you know, a very large increase of productivity growth, which uh, lasted uh, for, you know, for many, many, many decades. Then, you know, more recently, this was the kind of third wave of the third industrial revolution around digital innovation and the internet that helped power the growth of uh, productivity growth that we saw from the earlier graph where we had the, uh, the, the kind, of, kind of mid 90s to mid 2000 change. And many people think we're now living through a potential fourth industrial revolution around AI and robotics and, and, and gene therapy. So these are all the kind of, you know, you know clearly important sets of innovations which help leading, leading growth. But I, I want to argue that if we think about growth, it's not simply about these hard technologies and that management practices are actually an also important driver of, of growth. So on the one hand, there have been, in my view, actual innovations in the form of management, things from Taylor's scientific management to Ford's mass production, and even the Smith's pin factory back there, which harks to some of these, to more recent things like the Cherry to Lee manufacturing system. So I think these are genuinely new ideas which have enabled us to increase productivity. But also, if we think about some of the other innovations, the technological innovations I mentioned earlier, um, for example, you know, think of Paul Davis' work on electricity. It took many decades before the invention of electricity fed through the productivity numbers. And this was partly because of the need to make managerial and organizational changes to make best use of those innovations. So we had to you know, develop 24 hour production in the factory system in order to make great use of, you know, of, of electricity. Um, my own work looking at computers suggests that if you look at the impact of information technology, a lot depends on the kind of management quality of which the organization is based in. You know, I used to, you know, I spent a year of my life <coughs> working in the National Health Service, and there was a multi-billion pound program there, which basically failed. And a part of that, I think, was just due to extreme managerial failures. And maybe one of the reasons that we haven't seen artificial intelligence um, having such big effects on productivity is that we're still learning the best way to kind of use it. Many firms spend huge amounts of money to relatively little effect. So we've often thought that management matters a lot, of course, but the problem has been it's extremely difficult to measure management of that. Uh, um, <clears throat> Chad Syverson uh, in his uh, JEL um, article said no potential driving factor of productivity is seen a higher ratio of speculation to empirical study. Um, and, you know, here's a picture of the, uh, you know, where we used to catch planes, this is the San Francisco bookshop. Uh, which I'd often go to and, uh, you know, with uh, working with Nick Bloom at Stanford. And you can see lots of case studies here about famous managers and very uh, successful firms. <clears throat> um, and, I, I, what, you know, I, I've always been interested in management, but, you know, I, I became sceptical. I started working on this issue with uh, man, many management consultants like McKinsey. I was uh, one, one McKinsey consultant, I remember a presentation of his book, um, and he was presenting it in the uh, early 2000s and saying that he was working with this amazing company which had this, these, these very dynamic manual practices. They were things which were enabling the company to be super successful and other companies should be imitating their kind of, uh, their kind of you know, weightless type of management practices. And as he was talking, it turned out this company was called Enron. 
And uh, this was at the time when the CEO of Enron was being dragged off in chains by uh, the US government for, uh, uh, for accounting fraud and, and shareholder fraud. In fact, so much so that many of the shareholders and workers said the Enron symbol should be changed from what you see there to something which is more appropriate over how they uh, treated their shareholders and workers. So, you know, the, the point of this is to say that, you know, it's very hard to extrapolate from case from case studies, despite their usefulness for teaching. And as a result of this, um, over the last 15 years or so, I've been working a lot with colleagues like Nick and Stanford and Raphaela Sadden and Harvard to try and measure management practices in a more a robust and internationally comparable way. So um, if you're interested in this Google the World Management Survey, you can download all our, all our, all our data that we make, make it available uh, online for people. The way that we try and collect data, you know, we've done this in different ways over the years, but we have this kind of three-pronged methodology that we, um, we developed a set of 18 questions, which we think are related to basic productivity measures. So, you know, collection of data, how you use that data to uh, set targets, how you use those targets or don't use those targets to incentivize your people in terms of pay, promotions, retentions, and hiring. Uh, so these were worked out from, uh, you know, lots of discussion with people in industry. And the way to think about this is given what you're producing, how could you produce them more efficiently? So um, we um, delivered this survey. It's a kind of 45 minute telephone interview. We started off with the manufacturing plant managers, and now we've actually expanded this to you know, just about every other sector of the economy, like healthcare, education, retail, and so on. Um, we, uh, we try to get relatively unbiased uh, responses. We do kind of, we uh, have different interviewers interviewing the same company and answering different people to try and avoid bias from giving answers you'd expect. Uh, we also have a, you know, official endorsement for reputable institutions like uh, the Bundesbank and the Bank of England. And it's run by uh, 200 kind of MBA types who are, you know, it's hard to work with MBAs. I used to teach MBAs a lot, but I tell you what, they get the job done <laughs> because they're very persistent in getting people through, through on the phone. So anyway, so we have, you know, from this data, it's very rich. We do many things with it. But you know, one of the things that we do is just to kind of calculate a simple management score to enable us to look across different countries. Um, and you know, what you see when you do that in terms of this kind of index of manager quality, you kind of see what you might expect. So you know, the most productive countries like the United States are very high up. As you go down, you get kind of Western European countries like you know, Britain, France, and so on. As you go further down, you get emerging economies like Turkey and China and the African and poor Latin American countries are kind of a, 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 at the bottom of the pack. So this lines up quite closely with measures of productivity or GDP per capita uh, that you can see from this graph. Now, from a macroeconomic point of view, maybe the ECB is what you mainly care about. From a, as a, as a microeconomist at heart, uh, I actually care a lot about the variation of this within countries. And, you know, this is very startling. So what this does is it takes um, all the firms from every country and within each country looks at the distribution. So, you know, a, a, a kind of a score of about three is average, a score of four or five is a high score, a score of one or two is, is very low. So you can see a kind of a bell curve type of shape as, as, as you might expect, you know, but you see a lot of these very badly managed firms. So firms which are scoring between one and two, they're basically not really collecting data on the process of what's going on. Uh, they're not communicating this at all to their, uh, man their kind of senior managers or the workers. They're not they're promoting people purely based on tenure or connections rather than on, on ability and merit. They're not dealing on the performance. So it's amazing as an economist why you see these firms existing, but they do exist. And there's a lot of them. And there's a lot of them in, in just about every country you look at. But the second thing to look at, and I, I, so I apologize to the Italians in, in the audience for not picking Italy just as an example of a kind of, you know, uh, ECB country. Uh, if you compare the US to Italy, Yes, Italy has a lower score than the US, but it's not like every American firm has very high management scores and every Italian firm has low scores. There's a lot of heterogeneity. Um, and one big difference between the United States and Italy is the lower tail. There's a lot thicker lower tail in Italy than the US. So these really badly managed firms, they seem to be selected at a much less, much slower rate in Italy than America, which again suggests a role for misallocation. And, you know, you can if you look into these many of these are small family firms who seem to be able to survive for much longer in italy than they do in the united states 
So these management scores are strongly correlated with measures of productivity, of profitability, of innovation, of, of trade. Um, and there's lots of evidence now from RCTs that this is a kind of, you know, not just a correlation, there's also a causal relationship. So if you look at how important management is for productivity, it accounts for about a 30% on average of TFP gaps in the United States across our different countries. Um, even more so for countries like Italy, it accounts for about 50% of the difference. And of this, of this uh, third, about a third of that is just reallocation. So a third of the reason these orange bars, the fraction of TFP you, you explain, about a third of those orange bars is, is because the you know, countries like Italy uh, are a lot less effective at giving greater outputs to the, uh, the better managed firms. So that, that process of, um, of misallocation appears to be much stronger in some, say, some European countries, developing countries, than it is, say, in the United States or Sweden or, or, or the UK. Actually, what I should just, as, as a sidebar, I should say one, uh, one fun thing about uh, doing the radical econometric methodology called talking to people is that you find out a lot of things you weren't expecting. So, uh, for example, the, uh, you know, we asked uh, in uh, one of our Italian firms, uh, you know, do you have, you know, uh, who owns you? And one production manager was very honest and said, we are owned by the mafia, which a very nervous interviewer said, I think that's in the other category. Although I guess I could put you down as an Italian multinational, which is how this um, is, is recorded. Uh, having lived in, uh, in the United States for a while, uh, as you can see, the management scores are high, the productivity is high. Not everything is great. I had a daughter in public school and, uh, you know, we were asking uh, one interviewer, uh, asking them whether, you know, how many production sites do you have abroad, see so whether we're a multinational. The manager in Indiana said, well, we have one in Texas, uh, which uh, some people say that's correct because Texas is a different country. But uh, I think on the map, that's not quite so correct. OK, so so management, I've argued, matters for growth and productivity. It also matters, you know, but can we, can you affect it? Are there kind of things that drive management? Well, there are very, some very systematic things. So uh, human capital, uh, if you look at the, uh, the fraction of people with college degrees and the management schools, there's a very strong correlation, both for managers and for non-managers in, uh, in the relationship between having more, uh, more human capital and high management schools. Um, if, another important factor is information. So, you know, at the end of the management survey, we asked an open-ended question about how well uh, people thought they were managed on a scale of one to ten. Um, most people thought they were really well managed. They were, so, you know, it's the same way if you asked whether you're, uh, you know, whether you're a good driver, most people think they're way above average, but uh, they're unfortunately over-optimistic. Well, that may not be unsurprising. Maybe it's still the case that the relative score happens, matters. Turns out it doesn't. But, um, you know, people, if you, if you correlate the self-scored management with the actual uh, measure of profits or productivity, there's no relationship. And you know what we take from this is that there is a, a, a lot of poor information. So you know many uh, managers think they're super well managed and they're not. And you know many uh, firms, especially small and medium-sized enterprises, just haven't been exposed to good quality management practices. So that means that you know just like any other kind of technology, if you like, that poor information frictions are a reason for the slow spread of, uh, of, of better management practices. And what, one way to improve that is in multinationals. So if you look at multinationals, um, and what this graph does is it compares the management schools of domestic firms in red to foreign multinationals in black. And you can see that these foreign multinationals, no matter which country they're in, even when they're in countries where the management schools are relatively low, are able to get very high quality management practices. And the lesson from this that we take is that the kind of what multinationals do is they spread uh, best practice, not just in the kind of traditional hard technologies, but also in terms of managerial know-how, uh, in terms of uh, engineering techniques. And so being open to FDI, open to uh, allowing foreign direct investment is one of the best ways of actually spreading better practices and better productivity. Um, in some recent work, we've tried to you know look at more of the causal impacts of this type of uh, information shocks, if you like, from, um, from multinationals. So we, you know, we adopted this kind of million dollar plant approach of uh, Greenstone et al, where this is in the United States. We look at uh, places where multinationals, big new multinational uh, plants entered a local county and compared that to the runner up county. So the county where the multinational was thinking of it, it may locating its plant. So you know, Toyota, 
publishes information on, you know, it thinks of, uh, you know, it's either going to go to Huntsville or, or Charlottesburg, it eventually goes to Huntsville. So we can compare the counties where Huntsville went to the counties where Charlotte, Charlottesville went. And when you do that, you see that the incumbent plants, so not the, not the multinational itself, but the plants in the same county benefited from productivity spillovers from having these multinationals located there. Um, and we particularly, we have our management practice scores and we can show this is after the entrance of the multinational, but the other, the other plants in the same county relative to the runner up um, counties, the plants which were close to the multinational had a significant increase of the management practice and the productivity. And interestingly, what this lower figure does, it shows you that the, the, the plants which benefited the most were the plants where managers were likely to move between the multinational and the local plants. So the spillovers seem to be operating kind of through a, a kind of a, a labor market effect where the information the managers had on the better manager practices got spread to the uh, to the other the other kind of establishments in the in the same area. So information seems really important. Competition seems very important. Uh, if you look at the uh, the kind of amount of reported competitors or some other measures of competition, stronger competition is associated with better management practices. Um, governance is also extremely important. So if we uh, look at the um, if we break down the management scores by different types of ownership and governance patterns. We find a very consistent pattern across our work that you know the dispersed shareholders the private equity firms tend to be the best managed if you're a family-owned firm with a, a professional manager in you also do pretty well the, the very low scoring firms are kind of family-owned firms which have a family ceo so uh you know th this is particularly bad if it's like your eldest son or eldest grandson who takes over the firm so, uh, you know, if you want to ruin a firm, give it to your older son as the kind of short, short motto here. So governance, governance matters. And many countries have lots of incentives to keep family, you know, to subsidize family firms with the tax system and other mechanisms. Our, our kind of work suggests that's, you know, not a, not, a, not a good idea. So governance is extremely important in terms of management and, and productivity. Okay, so um, I, I hope that's given you some, some, some arguments, you know, how we should think about uh, the drivers of growth. But what can we do going forward to, to get more growth? What kind of things should we do? So in terms of thinking about a growth plan, I think we should, obviously we should think about short run types of things and longer run types of things. And link the, what we have to do is link these together in an evidenced way to try and uh, come up with a, a plan for growth. So if you're interested in some of the details of the things I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you, there's, I'll make the, the slide pack available. Um, you know, I there's this, there's this kind of book I did called the LSE Growth Commission. There's some recent policy reports. There's a report here I did the Hamilton Foundation recently. But I'm going to give you an overview of the kind of principles I think are important for a, for a growth plan. So in the short run, I think that, you know, one of the, I think the mistakes we realized from the, the previous financial crisis is a kind of premature move to austerity, prolonging depressed demand is something we want to avoid. Yes, we you know, built up very large deficits due to the pandemic. But it would be a real mistake to try and you know reduce the whole of that deficit too quickly before the economy has a chance to recover. I mean, in, in Britain, my own country, uh, we saw the the costs of that in terms of the big cuts for infrastructure spending and public investment that were made in the in the immediate years following the recovery from the Great Recession, which prolonged it uh, much more than would have been the case. And it's part of the problem of very low productivity in the UK. The general principle is to try and balance protection and reallocation. So this is a hard thing to do, but you know, yes, we have to uh, do things to protect existing workers, but you know, we have to increasingly facilitate reallocation of jobs into new firms. So as we wind down, hopefully, many of the programs that we've had uh, to in order to support um, firms, you know, these are UK examples of. Uh, the wage subsidy scheme and the um, loan schemes to big businesses and, and small businesses. Um, these, these, these need to be wound down in a way which helps to facilitate redistribution, but also doesn't do it too quickly and cause you know, a massive wave of, uh, of bankruptcies. So I think there's many ways to do that. I think we have to own up to the fact we're going to need serious debt restructuring, not, you know, large fractions of these, this, the uh, investment here is going to, is not going to be paid back. So there's many ways we could think about doing that. So I think we could think creatively about debt for public equity swaps. 
in order to uh, you know give the government some of the upside potential of growth, but we're also going to have to think about just writing off some of the debts of these firms as well. Um, and there's a kind of you know a set of important questions about ways in which we could do that. There's very nice work by uh, Thomas Philippon and uh, and uh, Olivier Blanchard, the ways of designing programs to do that. And a really important thing in, is to kind of combine this with growth for startups as well. So, you know, too often we think about just you know protecting existing firms. You also have to think about getting the getting the, the environment and um, the sort of policy levers right for encouraging startups and growth with the next wave of uh, of new innovations and investments are going to come from. Okay, so there's there's sort of short run things. Now I want to turn to the kind of the more long run things to think about how we get um, this inclusive and sustainable growth. So one thing which is really important to think about is institutional architecture. So, uh, uh, you know, many of the ideas that, uh, that, that we have in terms of increasing productivity uh, face political constraints. And one of the big political constraints is kind of what I call um, policy attention deficit disorder. That with you know rapid turnover of political leaders and civil servants and often prime ministers in, in the UK, for example, uh, that leads to a lot of policy uncertainty. And this can be very damaging for long term investments and in things like infrastructure, um, transport, energy and things like human capital and things like innovation. So we have to think a lot of a lot of ways You know, this will be country specific. You know, in, 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 in the UK, for example, we recommended an infrastructure commission, an infrastructure bank, uh, in order to try and deal with this. And those, those are innovations which are being adopted. And in a part of the, the idea of this is to add some extra grit uh, in the policy mill. So, um, you know, many policymakers find it very difficult to resist the temptation to um, say cut, cut infrastructure when you need to make budget cuts um, or to do things which are politically expedient. So having institutions which have expert advice, which are a bit of a distance from policymakers, indeed, like the ECB itself is. I know we think of this as monetary policy, but this is actually true across a lot of the different parts of the policy spectrum. So it, thinking creatively about institutions is important. We need structural policies to build flexible markets, competition policy, especially with the kind of growth of superstar firms and mega firm, you know, mega firms in the digital area, but also we have a general increase of concentration that we have to think about. The European Commission and the DG Comp has got very, you know, just the Digital Markets Union, the Digital Services Act are important innovation in this regard. We have to think about how we complete the single market, especially in services. We need reforms of labour market regulation to make labour markets work better. Uh, the third plank of this is human capital. So um, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for training and not just for worker retraining, but also managerial training, especially for small and medium sized enterprises. So, you know, I emphasize that the structural policies that we can do to improve management, like improving competition, improving governance, being open to FDI and so on. But there's also ways in which, you know, we can think about a modern industrial policy, which can have uh, training programs and ways of coordinating, dealing, getting local public goods to improve different sectors and regions, as well as reforming universities. But let me finish with, I think, what I, I think is the most important reason around innovation policy. So there is a wide range of policies that are used for innovation around the world. And in a way, the key thing is kind of to focus on, you know, looking at the evidence over what works in terms of policy. So we tried to pull this together in a paper that I did recently with uh, in the Deal of Economic Perspectives with Heidi Williams and Nick Bloom, where we tried to look at all the evidence around different types of innovation policies and put them together in a kind of a policymaker toolkit, um, looking at criteria like the quality of the empirical evidence, the how conclusive it was one way or the other, how quickly we get results. So you know, the aim of this was to say, you know, if a policymaker came to you and asked you, you know, I have a, you know, I have a billion euros to spend, how should I spend that on innovation? You know, one of the criteria may be how slowly or quickly we can get results. That's what we looked into. And we also looked into inequality a lot of the time, rightly or wrongly, when policymakers come and ask about, you know, innovation policies, they want to know what the likely effect is of inequality. And I think that's a, a, a legitimate thing to do. So I don't want to go through all this. I'm going to talk, you know, the way, the way that we summarise this was to look at different policies, look at the evidence, look at the benefit-cost ratio, look at the time frame, and look at the effect on inequality. So let me just mention a couple of these. So one is on taxes, R&D tax credits. We have very good evidence there, I'd say, that R&D tax credits can be effective. This is one of the areas where there's a, you know, a kind of a, a relatively quick win 
and in terms of increasing R and D in the way a well-designed tax tax credits can actually work. Direct government grants, there are less evidence on it, but we're building up more knowledge. And there's, I think at this point, we have a number of pretty good uh, regression discontinuity designs where we have evidence that uh, in the health area, energy area, and defense area, we actually can actually get crowd in of direct government grants, again, if well-designed, well-targeted, which there can be more than tax incentives to increase R&D. And I think, you know, that's a, you know, a, you know I, I don't think we should think about um, the tax policy and the direct subsidy policy as as things which we have to go for one or the other. Combining these, especially when we can target the direct policies around other kind of missions, like around climate change, are really can be really useful. Um, a problem with both of the tax and grant policies is that they're both subsidising demand, and if the supply side is relatively inelastic, and we might think that's true of say R and D workers. And all that you will get from subsidizing the demand side is higher prices rather than more quantity. So for uh, a kind of R&D person like myself, that might be great because our scientific wages go up, but that's not good for the taxpayer because it doesn't increase the volume of R&D. So in terms of in, you know, acting on the supply side, really that's about in, increasing the supply of human capital to be more effective. That can both directly increase innovation and also indirectly by reducing the equilibrium uh, cost of R&D. This will also actually induce more activity and also potentially reduce inequality as well. So I think this is, these can be really effective policies. So what can we do on the supply side? Increasing the STEM workforce, the science, you know, um, science technology, engineering, and, and, uh, and maths, uh, university reform, Im skilled immigration is a total no-brainer. So you know a lot of these policies, are, human capital is a long-term policies, which they take might take a long time to get through. But you know having a much more liberal policy towards um, towards bringing in uh, you know, uh, high, you know, high quality talent through the immigration is a really, you know, the politics are often harder, but the economics are really clear. The fourth thing I also want to mention is what I sometimes, what I've called in other words, the lost Einstein effect. And this is, you know, this starts off from the realization, this is going to work I've done with Raz Chetty, that, you know, we lose a lot of potential inventors, a lot of people who could have become inventors, we could we could have could have become entrepreneurs or innovators who we lose in our societies because of the underrepresentation of many groups women minorities kids from low-income families who could have been in the events of pool but are not because they haven't been exposed or given the opportunities to uh, expand their talents so here's one example this is from us data but what we did in uh, this paper which came out in the qj last year with, with raj and, and co-authors is that we got um, all the inventors in the US, so everybody who was on a patent document since 1996, and we track back to look at the through matching this to our de identified IRS data, um, what the income of the parents were. So, what this graph does, it lines up the um, percentile of the income distribution your parents were in from the top 1% to the bottom 1%, and looks at the fraction of everybody in those percentiles who grew up to become an inventor. So you can see a very strong positive relationship. So if you're born in the top, the bottom 50%, your uh, innovation rate was 0.8, whereas if you were born in the top 1%, your innovation rate was 10 times higher. So, you know, there is a, a very strong gradient. Now, of course, when we first presented this, many people said, well, that's just because, you know, if your parents are rich, they're cleverer, and if they're cleverer, the kids are going to be cleverer, therefore they're more likely to be inventors. Um, so what we could do is we matched in data on test scores of maths that these kids got when they were, you know, very young, like at age seven or age eight. And we showed that that could, that could the vast majority of this relationship was not explained by measures of ability, maths, English, other kinds of measures at a young age. So most of this is actually, uh, we argue in this paper, is due to the fact that many of these kids from low-income households just weren't given the opportunities, the educational opportunities, the exposure to innovation, which could have enabled them if um, they had those opportunities to become the inventors of the future. So this is the lost Einstein or lost Marie Curie type of effect. And you know, unlocking, we calculate that unlocking this hidden talent could potentially quadruple the innovation rate in the United States. And it's an example, you know, you think of educational interventions or interventions or mentoring programs, now, this is a pro this is something which would both help growth in the long run, but also help equity and uh, and social justice as well. And many you know, many nonprofits are taking up these ideas to try and to try and do them. 
And I should finally mention competition and trade policy being open to trade, I think another way of getting more innovation. So, you know, one of the problems with this innovation toolkit, so I like the innovation toolkit approach, but one of the problems with it is it doesn't take all the equilibrium interactions into account. Um, so, you know, combining this with other, other kind of ways to model this uh, in, a, in a more coherent way is kind of what we're doing with the research. And I th also think that, you know, it's, it's a, a way, you know, it's a bit of an economist way. We're always thinking incremental cost benefit. And I, I you know, I've made the argument, I became persuaded that the real way to push these type of arguments forward is to combine many of these most successful policies in terms of a package of policies around the missions we face. So we face major missions around climate change, around health, around defense. Put these together in a kind of coherent plan, like a grand challenge type of fund. And, you know, in the United States, I put forward this proposal to uh, increase um, federal R&D spending to about to, by $100 billion a year. Um, the Biden uh, infrastructure bill has about $500 billion, so it's a little bit less than I asked for, but still, you know, over, a, you know, the mine, was, mine was over a 10-year period, there was over eight-year period, so, you know, maybe it's not so bad. Uh, so, you know, I hope the infrastructure bill goes through because this could be a way of actually, I think, stimulating a lot more innovation and other people have also argued for you know, similar similar increases in Europe. We're already, you know, we have you know, various things which are happening in Europe to try and also increase that innovation spending. So, you know, just to wrap up, um, you know, is, is this politically feasible or not? Um, you know, the world has had a particular severe productivity growth problem uh, after global financial crisis. You know, we've had uh, you know events which are causing major damage, COVID and Brexit, you know, are both things which loom large. But one of the things that we we can learn about from history is that when we have these major shocks, they can be times where we can have radical change. So if you think about what happened after World War II, it was a a moment in which many of the economic models got reset and new institutions got built. And I think there is a across many parts of different political parties, there is a consensus that there is this need for a larger investment innovation. And I think, and we've seen this during the COVID pandemic, there can be an important role for the state in helping to rebuild the real economy. So I think we're at the point in which there is a desire for this change. We can learn a lot from economic work and social science about what policies work and what don't work and it's time right now to move from worse to action to create the kind of sustainable and equitable growth we're going to need over the next few decades to restore our, our prosperity. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Um, okay, I'm going to shoot a few questions. Um, first question is on uh, misallocation, which you uh, measured uh, with differences in productivity. So the question is whether such differences in productivity may also relate to a kind of a winner takes all in markets, so not necessarily misallocation. And if so, uh, basically, you know, what is the role of market power in these relationships? And uh, if you could say something about the debate that we have here in Europe about, you know, are we missing something with Right, by not having super firms, because you talk quite negatively about super firms, but some others say, well, it's a great mess here in Europe. So, so what's your take basically on sort of competition <laughs> policy, I guess? That's yes. The, the broader question. The, those, the, those, the, those, those are all great questions. And it's things that you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I've been actively working on. Um, so, uh, you know, stepping back a little bit. So, you know, there have been these big changes to the business landscape, uh, you know, across the world and you know one of the things that we've seen we, we do see actually in Europe as we do in the United States increases of industrial concentration which have occurred um, you know on average across a, a, a wide range of industries so, you know, partly that's because of you know the, the digital industries we see that very directly but we also see that in many other and many of many many other industries as well and that seems to have gone hand in hand with you know, that's an increasing differences in size, but you see increasing differences in productivity, increasing differences in, 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 in markups and growth in accurate markups. Now, is this all a, a bad thing? You know, I, I don't, I, 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 I personally, you know, I personally think a lot of the reason for that is exactly because we are moving to a more winner-take-all type of uh, economy. 
and you know you see that very directly in the digital type of sectors because of platform effects you also see that in non-digital sectors because the you know the fixed cost of like walmart buying a massive you know ict logistics system is just very high and a small store can't do that so you i think part of this is due to kind of changes that we've seen in, in technology and most of this growth of large firms is due to that but i think the problem is you know however we've got there because we have these you know a large number of these very powerful firms they have the capability and many times the incentive to do things which are against the interests of consumers and workers so i think that even though the main reason that these firms have become successful isn't because they've been you know doing illegal anti-competitive things i mean there is some of that going on but that's not the that's not the predominant reason there is a risk as the society becomes more and more winner take all that um this is going to have some negative consequences so i i do think we have to think about changing the way we do competition policy in order to deal with that so for uh, one example of that would be to say that too much of competition policy is kind of backward looking so when you look at a merger we say what's your market shares if they're not too big then we let it go through it has to be forward looking so you know many of the firms which get taken over by you know think about facebook instagram are small small platforms yet when the, if they were allowed to survive they could have become competitors in the future so we have to really look about look at future competition and and you know i think more and more shift the burden of proof away from the uh the large companies taking over these new platforms um put the burden of proof on you know, making them show if they're doing a takeover this is not likely to cause cause problems so i think there has to be a hold on john sherrill does some very nice work that i've been discussing with him that he's doing as part of his detail the quality review on the types of reforms which need to be made the commission is doing some of this work and so was, there, there is activity going on but i think you know even if you're optimistic about the reasons we got we got here you, you should be i think uh proactive in trying to uh, make sure that these these firms are not abusing their kind of um, position of competition in terms of europe I, I do think we need to um think of how we can make our markets work better to uh, enable this reallocation to take place i think that has a lot to do with having to improve the kind of uh, functioning of product markets and uh, labor markets and financial markets. So I think, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to allow greater reallocation to take place. Thank you. Um, the two questions on management practices. The one is, uh, so you're calling for, you're advocating inward uh, FDI. Um, so should we also in Europe embrace FDI from China? That's one question. Um, and the other question is, um, you said that in terms of family firms, um, the worst thing to do is to pass them on to the next generation. And here in Germany, of course, we are you know, about to enter a phase where a lot of family firms are actually passed down into the next generation. And a lot of the uh, patriarchs are complaining that the next generation doesn't want to take over. Is that actually <laughs> a good thing? Yes. <laughs> uh, on the, so yeah, these are very high. So on China, yeah, so China is, is uh, of course, there's a there's a lot of controversy over Chinese FDI. There's questions now being debated over should there be additional, um, you know, uh, scrutiny of deals, not just from China actually, but from any any kind of foreign uh, players. Now let's let's not be under any illusions. You know, China is a strategic competitor. You know, China is doing a lot. Is a, is a you know communist dictatorship. It's doing a lot of bad things, and we have to be careful from a defence point of view over the degree to which technology gets to China and can be against our interests. So that that we have to look at these in a kind of you know with a with a with a with a with a, with a, with a realistic framework. But I, I think that I I'm I would I mean two things. One you know for for the, for friendly countries. <laughs> I, you know, I, I would, I would, I would take a quite a liberal approach. So, you know, you know, United States and Japan, South Korea, and so on. So, you know, I worry that you know the, this this China worries may then spill over into making it harder to allow foreign acquisitions for some other other countries, which actually can be can be beneficial. Um, and I, you know, although I, I know I, I would I would circumscribe the degree to which when we look at foreign uh, acquisitions and, and uh, 
and take others. We don't use like defence reasons as a reason for you know for being overly protectionist. And we have a history of that in Europe. So I I do think we should be very careful about overly restricting the ability of uh, of companies to, to come into Europe, even though we have to be you know, realistic about uh, China and other strategic competitors. In terms of the uh, you know so I. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, people, family firms are always complaining. And I have to say for any family firm members in the audience, I, I, I often give speeches with, with family firm federations. You know, there are a lot of good family firms. You know, I'm talking about the mean. There's a variation around. It. <laughs> However, um, you know, uh, if you thought about all the people who could be the best person to run your firm, it may be your eldest son, but there may be other people <laughs> who could also be pretty good at running the firm. Um, you know, Warren Buffett says, if you were choosing the uh, German Olympic 100 meters team, would you, your policy rule be, I'm going to select the eldest son of the person who won it 21 years ago? Probably not, you know. They may. <laughs> so uh, I, would, I would say that we, you know, you know from, from a kind of business point of view, I would certainly consider many other things in the new succession plan. From a policy point of view, I think you know it's better to have a level playing field. So what I would I, I'm against is, as exists in many countries, lots of tax breaks to encourage family-owned firms, such as exemptions, you know, from mass exemptions from an inheritance tax. So I, I don't think we should be doing things which are, are country friendly. Germany is quite interesting actually because the Mittelstand of Germany has a tradition actually of uh, much more so than say in France or Germany of bringing in outsiders. To run, um, to run their firms. So the, the ownership stays in the family, but the uh, the managing director or the CEO is actually a professional from outside the family. And as I showed you, that's actually a pretty good model. The problem is, it's when, you know, you know, when you, as a rule, as an effect of rule, you just assume that the best person to run the firm is gonna be the, the family member. Um, you know. Thanks. Um... There's also a question about gov government grants, um, which you advocated to get R&D going. Um, so recently, the European Commission uh, floated the idea that Europe should develop uh, a sizable microchips industry, for instance. So, so more generally, how much of that transformation into the digital space should be government-led? Uh... Right. That's a, that's a. I mean, I, there's a role for government, certainly. Um, and in, you know, in, in, I mean, like in, in climate, you know, so climate. No, no, think about climate change. There's a clear mission of green technologies. You know, even without all the other market failures that we know for innovation, like you know, spillovers, knowledge, you'd want to do something. Uh, health and pandemics, you want to do something. Defense, clearly, you want to do something. Microchips, digital. I, you know, I, I can. Uh, I can see there are some roles for government at some places, especially at the more basic science type of ends, for sure. When you then get into the question of, you know, how much should you be subsidizing the production of semiconductor chips? Because like there, there I start getting more nervous because, I, you know, you've got to think about what are the market failures you're trying to address. So there may be, and I don't know enough about um, so the, you know, the particular particular industries, but there is a clear market failure that you, you've identified and, and you want to deal with. But you know, I think that you, you would you would want to be very careful about saying you're going to go all in for say the production of the next generation of semiconductor chips. I mean, for one thing, there are many other countries doing the same, and for another, you'd want to see exactly you know where that market failure is going to work and how the policies are going to be. You know, joined up to make that work. I think, as a general principle, when we're thinking of and you know how you allocate the subsidies, part of it is there's a strategic element, but part of it is that you want to have the the agency which is delivering the money to be have you know almost maximum political shelter from the government. Because the worst thing is if it's basically politicians are heavily involved in giving out money because they're you're very opening yourself up to rent, rent seeking type of behavior. So what you want to do, a bit like the infrastructure commission I, I kind of discussed briefly, is that you want to set up institutions which have a lot of independence from governments, uh, you know, whereby you know, if you know, the government can set the overall agenda, the overall target, but leave it 
like the ECB, <laughs> to you know people who know what they're doing to kind of make the decisions rather than having you know having governments you know, involved all the time. So there may be a case in parts of the digital sphere, especially in the basic research end. Uh, I think in terms of the more production side, you know, you have to think about that on a case by case basis. I, I haven't seen a totally compelling argument for that yet, but I haven't looked into enough detail. Well, thanks, John. Um, we've run out of time, but maybe I can ask a last question um, that keeps coming up, which is, I mean, you talked about the importance of breaking pessimism. Um, so how do we rally people? I mean, you, you, you propose a number of topics like climate, well, maybe in Europe that, that speaks to a lot of people, defense, maybe less so to some people. Um, so how do we go about um, I, 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 yeah, I, so, well, you know, this, this is through the political psychology is not <laughs> necessarily, especially with Brexit, it's made me so depressed, I'm not sure I might be the right person to ask, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, those of you who don't know, I was a big opponent of Brexit, and it, uh, yeah, so I, I think that there is, there is a, a moment we're living through now, and it can go, you know, it can go both ways, so, you know, it could lead to great depression, Know, not just economically but also psychologically um, given the pandemic but I think it, it could also be a moment where we realize there's an opportunity to really you know change change the game um, and you know, the ability to you know as we saw off the second world war the ability to say okay now we have a we have to rebuild ourselves so you know I started to take this huge hit how are we going to rebuild ourselves let's think about what the you know, the radical things are to, to, to change ourselves. Climate change is a great rallying thing. We like, you know, in Europe, you know, we want to be leaders to take climate leadership. So combine that desire to be leaders in climate with also the, you know, the, 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 the great um, depth that we have at high human capital, a lot of you know, good, strong research and development, a lot of possibilities for innovation, and put those together. Uh, so I think that might be a way that kind of mission uh, of climate change, maybe environmental things more general, is might be worth galvanizing a lot of people, especially young people, to 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 find this as an exciting new new program of, of, of the future. So I think that 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 would be one way. I mean, the the, the defense is like a, there is the fear factor. I mean, that goes. You know, I'm you know as I said, I'm I'm less you know keen on that, but it is a real factor. So you know, the the fear of China and the fear of the kind of Western liberal democratic model being in abeyance should also galvanize people saying, well, you know, how do we want emerging and developed economies you know, to make the case that they should be more open and have liberal uh, democracies like Europe and America rather than the Chinese model? And, you know, that, that means we're in competition with China to do that. And China is a threat. So that may also, is also a galvanizing force, would be a galvanizing force. And, you know, it could lead to, it could lead to, oh, you know, there's nothing we can do, but I'm more, I, I am cautiously optimistic that, that you know, we, we have the knowledge of how to, you know, create growth. We have the comparative advantage in this in Europe and maybe with climate change, we have the opportunity in the middle of a pandemic to really make, make big changes. So, you know, let's, let's try and take this as an opportunity. Well, great. Thanks for ending on this optimistic note, John. Um, so thanks on behalf of all of us. There were many more questions, but uh, we will uh, share Slide. Yeah, do, do share them and, and send me emails, yes. and I'm very happy to to to, to, to respond you know, to to questions that people have. Okay, well, all the best now, and bye. Bye.